You know, some say ignorance is bliss. If you prefer that ignorant bliss, then now's the time to turn the TV off because you'll have no excuse left by the end of this to not take your rightful place as a warrior protecting and preparing the next generation. We're the Starbucks. We left the entertainment business because we knew that a silent war was being fought for the minds of America's children. And we knew that nothing would matter more than exposing it and stopping it. That's why we're here now, to expose the war on children. How long has this been going on? How did it happen? Who's responsible? How far down the rabbit hole does this all go? We know it's overwhelming, so let's start here. First, you need to understand that one of the most effective forms of normalizing the woke agenda is via something called the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure effect is a psychological phenomenon by which people tend to develop a preference for things or people that are more familiar to them than others. That means the more you show someone something, the more they start to like it or prefer it. This psychological mere exposure effect is the reason society is now flooded with imagery of what would have been considered fringe by most people only 10 years ago. I was a director in Hollywood for some of the biggest stars, so I speak from experience when I tell you that the mere exposure effect is how the media creates the reality we live in. Simply exposing the public to fringe concepts makes us normalize things that have never been considered normal before. This social engineering is how you make people see theories as facts, facts as theories, opinions as violence, silence as safety, and men as fully able to become women with the snap of their fingers. With the power of the mere exposure effect, you can make almost anyone believe anything with enough pressure and exposure. This makes it one of the most dangerous weapons that kids face today. For instance, you might be wondering why some politicians propose seemingly ludicrous bills, like the one in Michigan threatening people with five years in prison for misgendering someone. It's not because they believe they can get away with it now. It's because they understand the process of normalizing prison over pronoun violations today so that it can become a reality in the future for the next generation. The mere exposure effect is why the concept of putting a screen in front of your child as a babysitter became normal. You saw people do it on TV when they were exhausted. You saw it in commercials. You saw it on social media. And then finally, it was normal. The mere exposure effect is also why Hollywood is flooding children's shows with woke agendas and sexual content, while most parents aren't looking because they have a trust bomb with the shows they watched as a kid. I'm Gonzarella. Calling me a she or a he doesn't feel right to me. Oh, I'm sorry I used the wrong name and pronouns. Hey, Blue! Trans members of this family all love each other so proudly and they all go marching in the big parade. Come join the fun! The mere exposure effect is why Scholastic is featuring books pushing transgender ideology on kids. It's why Bugs Bunny was naked at a pride parade. It's why kids are bombarded with pharmaceutical ads on nearly every TV station. It's why the White House is flying a trans flag at the center of their flag display. And it's why nearly every corporation and sports team on the planet feels the need to create a custom pride logo that they use every June. It's why the Washington Post ran a piece encouraging kids to see kink at pride parades. And the New York Times ran a film review lamenting that the new Little Mermaid didn't have enough kink for their liking. It's why Target is selling trans pride toddler onesies and tuck it swimsuits and it's why they did TV shows and magazine covers to normalize sex changes for kids, but never did a show or cover updating you that those kids no longer identify as the sex they pretended to be on those shows or covers. So why would corporations take part in this effort to destroy the fabric of reality as we know it? To find out, we sat down with Justin Danhoff. He's a Wall Street expert who's made it his mission to answer this question. So how did wokeness take over corporate America? It was a tripart takeover. It was bottom up, it was top down, and it was outside in. Top down, if you look at the banking industry, if you look at the past political affiliations of the board members, it's over 80% leaning to the left as opposed to the right. So there's no longer a balance at the top. What do I mean when I say bottom up? 
The same thing that's happening on college campus, we're now seeing on the corporate campuses, where conservatives, they keep their mouth shut. The woke employees, they feel very empowered because they now know the C-suite and the board agree with their woke positions. And then there's the outside in. When you talk about companies like BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, you know, they're probably your largest shareholder and they're demanding you take certain actions. What is ESG and how is it used to push woke ideology? It is social change by changing business behavior, by changing culture. So I, for example, went to the shareholder meetings of Amazon, Facebook, and Google. At all three of those meetings, they announced that they were adopting affirmative action policies for their board in reaction to shareholder proposals. Jesse Jackson was at two of those three meetings applauding. Why are shareholder proposals important? That's one reason. But they also moved the cultural needle. Fast forward three years, that's when Goldman Sachs announced that they were no longer going to finance any company's IPO unless they had at least two diverse board seats in the terms of affirmative action. That's when NASDAQ put a rule in place where they said they are going to delist you from the exchange if you don't have two diverse board spots, one for a woman, one for an underrepresented minority. Why is it that our kids today are faced with pride flags everywhere they go, no matter what, at every company? Now to keep your perfect score on the Corporate Equality Index, you have to have three events each year that promote the LGBTQ plus community. So, you know, you've got your Super Bowl ads that have gotten crazy, there's one. You get your, you know, flag up on all of your, you know, social media and your website during Pride Month. You better find a third really quick before the year runs out or you're gonna lose your perfect score. What happens if a company steps out of line and they don't do those three things? They are tarred and feathered and shamed. As a consumer, as a mom, it feels like corporate America has given us all a giant middle finger. Are they banking on us going back to those same buying behaviors after these Balenciaga and Target boycotts are over? Yeah, they, they frankly are. Talking with Justin got us thinking. How well do we know where our money is going when we shop at Target or get our insurance from State Farm? We looked and found that Target has given over $2 million to GLSEN, an organization that promotes schools secretly transitioning children and undermining parents, while State Farm went the extra mile after their donation to GLSEN by partnering with an organization called Gender Cool. The program that they supported gave LGBTQ plus books to kids as young as five years old to introduce concepts about gender identity and transitioning to them. These companies aren't alone though. A quick look at GLSEN's website displayed sponsorships from Hollister, Disney, PetSmart, Gucci, YouTube, New Balance, Hulu, Amazon, Calvin Klein, Nickelodeon, Walmart, and many more. GLSEN also supports pornographic books in schools and opposes the removal of them. GLSEN is only one of the nonprofits using funds donated by corporate America to fundamentally change the reality we live in. These are other groups that many corporations are giving money to without your knowledge. Even Walmart has funded drag shows and gender ideology for kids. Every once in a while, powerful people pull back the curtain to expose the plan. This video is one of those times. In Davos a couple of years ago, Vice President Biden met privately with those of us working behind the scenes. And he sat down with us and looked us in the eye and he said, you companies can do what we government cannot and will never do. You have to change the world on this issue. We are committed to change the world for LGBTI inclusion around the world. How many companies have signed on to that now? 270. Our goal is to get many, many more and, um, and then to work around the world. We're bigger than most, a lot of countries. So tremendous power. After talking to Justin, we still had questions. So we sat down with a former top executive at one of the largest ad agencies in the world, Deutsch. So I was chief creative officer at, at Deutsch. Um, I was there for eight years. And before that, I was 12 years at TBWA Shia which is the other probably biggest agency on the West Coast. What does diversity, equity, inclusion look like at a major ad agency? Diversity is conformity. Uh, equity is unfairness. Uh, and inclusion means exclusion. Every ad is about advancing wokeness of some kind. We used to sit around and say, what does our agency stand for? What does this brand stand for? We're not asking that question anymore. We stand for diversity, equity, and inclusion which is wokeism, just packaged up for corporations. Are they intentionally sexualizing our children and stealing their innocence? 
I think they're trying to introduce the radical gender theory, radical gender ideology to your child. They're using commercials and merchandise and what they're selling to get your kid to believe that. That is how advertising works. Over time, it's building equity, brand equity in your mind. Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 100 companies have decided that they're going to indoctrinate your children with radical gender ideology and that's 100% what they're going to do and they don't even question it and you should just expect that. It just seems like there's no moral you know, construct at all no. or end to this. No, no boundaries mm -hmm. to message sexuality to kids, to the gender ideology. Um, if we don't speak up, it's over real fast from here. I don't, I don't think it's gonna take long now. So as long as they can protect their own kids from this insanity, they're perfectly okay with pushing it on unsuspecting children whose parents maybe aren't present. I think that's right. I think they feel at this point the incentives are greater to do that. What do you think people, parents out there should do to prevent this from hurting their kids? Basically, the thing I would tell parents is there's an all out assault for, the, for your, the brains of your children and it's coming through every form of media you can imagine. And if you don't know that, you're naive and it's going to transform your child's mind and it won't take long you know, unless you guard their mind. So what can you take away from this? Look at the examples set this year by conservative boycotts of Bud Light and Target. Those companies have lost over 40 billion since the start of those boycotts. Use your money as a weapon to fight back in the war on children. Go the extra mile to buy from companies or small businesses who aren't pushing woke agendas. This is key to reclaiming America and it's a far smaller price to pay than our ancestors had to pay. Know what your kids are doing online and protect them from the harmful content before they see it. Talk to your kids about how advertisers and major corporations are using the mere exposure effect to change their values and beliefs. There's power in knowing, and often you'll see that they resent being manipulated like this by powerful entities. Knowledge is power, and a generation that seeks truth is a generation that can save America. Every parent needs to realize that what you've seen so far is only one part of the mere exposure effect that's been driving what can only be described as a far left cultural revolution that's meant to destroy our country. But that's only part of the story. For the revolution to be successful, kids are the attack point. If this is a war on children, then what are the weapons being used? One of the most destructive weapons is social media. It's a weapon that communist dictators like Mao or Fidel Castro would have blushed over. With it, these powerful forces have the ability to censor what they don't want you to know and amplify what they want you to believe while normalizing that social media alone will have the power to transform a generation. Have children died because of social media? Absolutely. Have they been trafficked off of social media? 100%. Have they been sexually exploited off of social media? Ongoing, yes. How did social media influence your transition? Well, honestly, I didn't even know that transition um, from female to male was an option until I um, was on social media and began being exposed to um, those type of communities. Um, and it just really appealed to me as a scared, traumatized, you know, girl going through puberty, precocious puberty, and I just clung to that idea. What platform was the first platform you saw it on? Um, Instagram, but I think a lot of content trickled over from Tumblr and was reposted there. Did the algorithm eventually start feeding you this stuff in your For You pages and things like that where you would immediately see it even if you didn't follow the accounts? But I do think the algorithm was definitely geared toward and would recommend like more accounts and stuff like that. They were, they were pushing the idea of transitioning? Right, like a lot of LGBT pages and stuff like that. It's definitely alluring, you know, the idea of, you know, a super accepting, loving community. How accepting and loving have they been since you detransitioned? Honestly, if anything, I feel like I've been hushed. Um, I've been told I'm going to hurt trans people by speaking about my experience. Um, and that I'm taking their rights away. So they want to erase you. That's, that's what would make them happy. Essentially. At what age did you get into porn? So I got into porn at 18 years old and up until 23. And how did you get into it? So I came from a family, an immigrant family that didn't have a lot of money. I wanted to have, you know, financial freedom. So for me, it was very accessible. How has social media affected your life, your peers, 
and your generation as a whole. I'm scrolling on TikTok and I see these crazy people putting up the most awful things and I imagine I see little kids with TikTok. What are they looking at? I think that we have teenagers that grow up in society today and they feel heavily influenced. Now we're going to turn to the new warning from the Surgeon General this morning about growing concerns around social media and its impact on teens and why he's calling on companies for rigorous health and safety standards. It really is influencing our generation in more of a negative way than a positive way because people feel like they have to compete with these other people. I don't think a 10 or 11 year old should have social media. A child is easily influenced. Social media addiction is a growing concern for many parents. In fact, according to Pew Research, 97% of U.S. teenagers go online every single day. Like I'm young and I scroll through TikTok and I see all of these people who have jumped on the transgender bandwagon. Our generation is seeking affirmation constantly and that feels good and like I think a lot of people our age don't even care whether that's a real person or not. Do you feel like you're fed explicit content though as a young person by these social media companies? Oh definitely, 100%. Yes. I feel like it's making it, allowing it easier to get to pornography. When you see something you can't always like unsee it and stuff, so they're finding this identity in social media, in pornography, from the LGBTQ religion. There's a higher percentage of women that are addicted to pornography now. I know for myself I've fallen victim to uh, this type of thing. Sometimes I'll see like a drag queen being so sexual and gross and I'm like, what if the little kids who I babysit, who I see on their iPads, they're scrolling through TikTok, see that? People will get bullied if you don't have Instagram, if you don't have TikTok, if you don't have Snapchat, Twitter, whatever it may be. How's it affecting your friends? Like, what have you seen from them in terms of even changing behavior? I saw the kids who I grew up with turn into these transgenders, and I would have to call them Z, Zem, Zer, or I got in trouble. But I've seen a steady year by year change in their patterns and their belief systems. A friend of mine who clicked on the site kept looking and ended up starting addiction uh, to pornography. Kai Raychuk, the founder of Libs of TikTok, who for a very long time was anonymous. Nobody knew who you were. Let's talk about how you got here. It started during COVID time. There were all these TikTok videos going very viral on Twitter and it was mainly just COVID themed. I saw a whole nother side to TikTok that was went beyond um, the vaccine songs and the dancing nurses. And that was the LGBTQ activism on there. TikTok specifically is designed to target young young people. That's who their audience is. When you got on TikTok, you downloaded it. How quickly were you serviced those videos on you know trans content? Right away, almost immediately. It's the first thing that pops up. They feed you content about pronouns and about transgenderism and drag shows and all that kind of stuff. How do you see this when you watch these videos? Like, what is at the root of it? Attention and mental illness. And what is being done by our government? I don't see anything being done. Having young kids on social media is really, really dangerous. Does something need to be done, whether it's finding a way to segment and remove porn so that kids aren't exposed to it. Definitely. I think porn should definitely be restricted to 18 plus. I don't think kids should be able to access porn. Do you think that it's irresponsible or even unethical or wrong that social media companies invite children at age 12 and up to come out of their platforms knowing that there's pornography all over the platform and even predators that have access to kids? Absolutely. I feel like it is the responsibility of it all these social media platforms to put an age limit. Again, if it would be me, it would be 18 years old. After that, we were curious. Would young people today give social media to their kids? So would you give your children social media? Absolutely not. Mm -mm, not at all. No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Definitely not when they're younger. I don't think under 18. I would not give it to any child under the age of 16. I would not allow my children to have social media. I would not let my kids um, have social media as well. I think that social media is not good for kids. You know, looking at this whole landscape from social media, the Chinese influence when it comes to TikTok and AI, do you feel like this is a war on children? I know it's a war on children. And not just from a malicious foreign adversary, but from adults in this country who are visiting very corrupt values on children 
sexualizing them and doing so in some ways for profit. I think we can all see the evidence of our eyes and our ears. Especially so on social media. Especially on social media. And maybe becoming a mom awakened me to this danger and sort of the scales fell from my own eyes. But like they said, you know, we're coming for your kids. Yeah. And they are. And they have. What do you guys think is a bigger addiction problem and is hurting more people right now within your age group? Cigarettes or social media? Social media. Yeah, social media. Social media. No hesitation. No hesitation. Social media. Social media. Social media. I think that China's laughing at us. I think that Russia's laughing at us. And I think that you can't have a strong country if you have confused citizens. The honesty from these young people hit us hard. They seem to know that their generation's addicted and that social media is hurting their generation more than anything else. Their instinct already is to protect their young. But what are they protecting them from? Remember this. No matter what the powerful entities across the world try to tell you, what the media industrial complex tries to tell you, you are your child's greatest teacher. And they won't always like what you say, but keeping them safe from predators and exploitation is more important than them being upset for a little while. We have to prioritize our job as the greatest teachers and protectors. Embrace the outdoors, embrace family time, embrace connection and faith, embrace wonder, embrace curiosity with you as their guide. Reject the culture that seeks to destroy traditionalism, reject isolation, reject synthetic experiences and choose real adventure. This is a cultural revolution that operates both online and offline, in the open and in the shadows. You are the warriors charged with protecting kids from it. If you still need convincing that this is a modern cultural color revolution, what's another sign that we're living through one? The remaking of parenting and education. But to understand where we're going, you have to understand where we are, where we were, and where we're going. Let's start with where we were. Sexualization in school used to be almost non-existent. Parents raised their kids instead of relying on screens. They took them out shooting targets, swimming, playing games, and exploring nature. Life was built around real experiences. And at school, we didn't have books with graphic illustrations of different kinks we could explore in the library. States didn't sue school districts in an attempt to force them to hide the gender identity or sexual orientation of students from their parents. We didn't have teachers forcing us to watch videos where we were exposed to pride videos featuring adults in intimate embrace. We weren't taught about blood play or bondage during sex ed. And we were taught to never keep secrets from our parents because predators could use that secrecy to groom you into abuse. Is it concerning that we're normalizing keeping secrets from parents or that you would be asked to do something? Does that make you feel that you're putting your students at risk? Absolutely. I'm gonna get emotional because I've been in that position as a child where really awful things happened to me and you know that individual wanted me to keep it a secret. I thankfully you know from a young age have always like stood firm in what's what's good and and right and true and I immediately the second my mom picked me up from school told her what happened and she took it to the police. It was so scary for me. I was put in a police car and we went to his house and I was so scared he was gonna see me, but they let me know he can't see you. We have bright lights on him. We just need you to tell us, was this him? And I said, yes. And it turns out that he was abusing his kids. And my mom and grandma told me that I was the little girl's angel because that abuse was finally, you know, taken out of, out of her home because I, I didn't keep a secret from my mom. And if I had, we can imagine, you know, how that would have played out, that abuse would have continued. I, I try to look at everything happens for a reason. And it, we have the choice to handle it in truth. Comprehensive Sexual Education, or CSE, is the name of the sex ed most kids are getting today in public schools. But where does CSE originate? 
a woman named Mary Calderon who believed that children are born sexual beings and that kids of all ages needed to learn about sex. Like CSE is this like very broad umbrella kind of education and term to what, to, to smuggle or sneak in all of the priorities of progressivism. So, you know, gender spectrums, transgenderism, abortion. So where does sex ed come from? Where does the kooky obsession with pushing porn on kids? Um, we might go back to Alfred Kinsey, um, who uh, in the late 1930s and early 1940s starts to parrot this belief about the sexuality of children. But the first director of the World Health Organization was named G. Brock Chisholm. And in 1945, G. Brock Chisholm goes to DC and gives three lectures on sex ed. And he says, quote, we have to eradicate the concept of right and wrong. Well, one of the senior chief administrators at the World Health Organization at the time was named Frank Calderon, was going around the country bringing the Las Vegas burlesque and putting on sexual titillating public performances for people in the 1940s. Frank Calderon was married to Mary Calderon, who left Planned Parenthood as Planned Parenthood's medical director in 1964 to found the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States, CECAS, which today is the major primary group at the helm of creating, promulgating, and raising up the next generation of teachers to integrate comprehensive sexuality education into America's public schools. Founding members of CECAS had said that, um, that children were sexual from birth and that we had to affirm the strong sexuality of the newborn. The seed money to found CECAS came from Hugh Hefner and Penthouse. The history behind this is far darker than most Americans understand. Mary's dead now, but her work is very much alive in CECAS, and it's influencing sex education in America more than anything else. CECAS advocates now for sex change surgeries. CECAS also partnered with a group called B-Vibe that sells bondage accessories and bondage teddy bears that kids might be drawn to. What about the books in school? Readers are leaders, right? If you've engaged in the subject of books online, then there's a good chance you've seen comments like these. People like you have been bold enough to say, this doesn't belong in our schools. This is what you don't want kids to see, is that correct? Exactly. And why is that? Why do you think this is inappropriate for children? That is grooming, but it's also a form of mental rape. You don't think that this is empowering or inclusive in any way when they talk about eating their own bodily fluids from sexual functions? That's not something that you think is empowering or inclusive for our children? You know. I'm filled with righteous indignation. We have people in this country, they will go to any extent to push their level of normalcy, which is really abnormal. It's abnormal to put that level of content in front of a child in the name of making sure that a gay boy or lesbian girl can feel good at school. What educational benefit will a child learn from even thinking about the idea of ingesting their own body fluid. These are celebrated books by the largest association for librarians in America. So parents need to understand that. So if you've ever heard this idea that there, there's just no pornographic books in our schools, I think we proved that wrong today. And so we're not into banning textbooks. We want to ban filth. I had a really hard experience with these books that I was reading from freshman year to sophomore year, and even in eighth grade. There was books about masturbation and books about rape. And I'm a teenage girl and I'm reading this, and it's horrifying, it made me uncomfortable. We want to ban pornography and we want to expose children to wholesome literature. We're each busting a load into this bottle. If you don't come, you have to drink it. Ha ha ha. Give me that. I'll show you how to do it. It comes with illustrations. This one is called Flamer, okay? Mm -hmm. Every one of these books can be found that we're showing today 
in a school library in America. And again, this is depicting children. This is, this is supposed to be kids. People in the Democratic Party who say there are no pornographic books in our schools. What would you tell them? I would say that they have reprobate minds and that their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. I think in many ways the adults had to become desensitized first to be willing to subject children to this type of content. What happened to society where we've all been groomed to now think that there's some sort of subjective interpretation of a blowjob or anal sex tutorial showing that to minor children. Oftentimes we hear about mama bears speaking up at school boards and addressing these issues. I'm trying to call forth the papa bears, men. And so I'm reminding men in America to stand up, square your shoulders, Use the authority that God gave you because men are called to be providers and protectors. But today, our men in the culture, our pastors in the culture are not engaging the intruders. The enemy has not crept around the back door. We have brought in the enemy through the front door and we're giving him the red carpet to push his agenda. I don't know that there's a more important call than that right now, you know, that men need to stand up because we've been involved in this fight and I've seen so many moms stand up, but dads seem to be slinking in the background. And I'm asking for men in the culture to stand on their post and to address these issues because we are almost at the point of no return. After investigating these books, we had to ask, are teachers okay with this? To find out, we looked into the views of the teachers' unions. The National Educators Association is the largest teachers' union in America, and we quickly found that this year they put gender queer on their summer reading list. And we found these recent panels at their annual conference. They include panels on critical race theory, so-called pedagogies of change, modeling climate change action, using education as a lever for environmental justice, decolonizing, recruiting allies, how to establish safe spaces, how to counter the quote, right-wing echo chamber, how to bring social justice into curriculum, reparations, gender theory, pronouns, encouraging student activism to achieve equity and justice. They also went on to have panels on transformative social change and using social emotional learning to bring about the transformative change that they desire. Social emotional learning programs are in just about every school now. And the warm fuzzy name makes a lot of people feel good, but what is it? Well, social emotional learning is a mental health and anti-bullying program that was originally brought into schools to teach kids how to manage their emotions and how to build healthy relationship with others. Unfortunately, now that has been completely changed. In 2020, the SEL Standard Bearer CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, changed the definition of SEL and its five core competencies to be a thing called transformative SEL, which is a completely different way of teaching SEL in that it does it through a racial and equity lens. What exactly does that mean? Right, so they think the original way that social emotional learning was taught was racist itself. Uh, they said that it made uh, children of color had to conform to the norms and standards of this white supremacist culture, and therefore it needed a whole redo. And what they're doing now is they're taking subjects that are usually taught in SEL, like empathy and perspective taking. And they're saying that in order to be empathetic, you have to understand that the whole systems of America, all the institutions have been set up to purposely oppress people of color and other oppressed groups. They're saying now that you have to understand that in order to be empathetic, you have to show compassion, means you have to do something. So that means you have to become a social justice activist for these racial and gender causes, and then work to tear down the systems of America to make them more equitable for those oppressed groups. Social emotional learning's been the biggest weapon uh, in this war on kids. They spend millions pushing SEL into schools, which is supposed to, in theory, make children more socially aware and able to have more positive interpersonal uh, skill sets and, and connections. Yet, we're seeing a lot more violence in classrooms. What is, where's the disconnect there? What's, why is this happening? Well, you said that they were supposed to be more socially aware and more connected. In that sense, this is true. They're socially aware of things like microaggressions, like reparations. 
So they're more socially aware. They're more socially aware that people can have infinite genders. They're more socially aware. Uh, they are more connected. They're more connected to men going to women's bathroom. They're more connected to them. We're seeing objective reality play out where there is more violence and, and teachers' hands are behind their back to stop it because of these restorative justice practices. So when the restorative justice came in, it basically said, depending on your skin color, you can't be punished this way because it would be not culturally responsive. So now if the child gets picked on to get bullied, they have to sit with the other child and understand why they acted out. The danger to that is that it, once it leaves public school, you see it now in a lot of cities like San Francisco where they don't even, they don't arrest anyone for like shoplifting. And we're seeing, you know, victims of horrific sex crimes have to sit face to face across from their abuser and negotiate you know, what that restoration process looks like. All these virtues are being taught through either the lens of a critical race theorist or a transgender cult recruiter. And then when they get older, they don't follow laws because they've been taught in schools that what they do is not their fault. And it's the same reason when a child sees a man in, or a girl sees a man in the bathroom locker room, they have to go through that struggle session. Uh, they have to get counseling to understand better be more socially connected, be more socially aware. And so that's the danger of social emotional learning, to understand language contamination, understand to ask the question through whose lens is this being taught through. And if, if, I, if I tell you something and I tell you this is from a mass murderer, you're gonna take that advice very differently than if I told you, oh, it's from a trusted mentor. At this point, you might be thinking that this sounds closer to communism than the school you remember going to. And while not all teachers are communists, Consider this. In Colorado, the teachers union representing 40,000 teachers voted this year to disavow capitalism entirely. In a statement that read, The CEA believes that capitalism inherently exploits children, public schools, land, labor, and resources. Capitalism is in opposition to fully addressing systemic racism, the school-to-prison pipeline, climate change, patriarchy, gender and LGBTQ disparities, education inequality, and income inequality. In Oregon, a high school teacher at Churchill High School recently asked his students to write stories about their sexual fantasies. The California Teachers Association Conference had a presentation on how to introduce unlimited genders and transgenderism to toddlers, while yet another English teacher in Pennsylvania showed his students penises and videos of ejaculation, and another had kids in her class read a book we discussed with John Amanchuwu called This Book is Gay. Stories like these seem to happen on such a regular basis that the shock factor almost begins to fade away. And all of this is happening as Democrats and the Biden administration create hundreds of millions in funding for something called, quote, community schools. Those are schools that provide health care in addition to the regular curriculum. Like social emotional learning, that might sound nice at first glance, but it really means that your child can receive sexually oriented care or counseling that you aren't told about. And then we have teachers going on national TV to say that parents don't have rights once they send their kids to public school. But allowing movies such as this assist teachers in opening a door for conversations that have no place in our classrooms. That, that just shows me that she's ignorant and has not come and volunteered at all. Because our, these conversations, these doors, they're open. These students have one-to-one -one devices. The amount of things that they're able to pull up that we have to shut down, they, they, these conversations, these doors that she's talking about, that's t telling me I'm stripping her rights as a parent, those rights are gone when your child's in the public school system. Activist teachers like this used to pretend that CRT didn't exist in schools. But now they're the first to tell you how important DEI and CRT are in education. This is why when we're talking about, let's say, critical race theory in school, people go, they're not teaching critical race theory. It's actually much worse. When a child walks into a K through 12 today, they're not learning about critical race theory. They're learning how to behave and act and think and make decisions like a critical race theorist. And that means that America is oppressive, America is racist, uh, your skin color determines your success, and so on and so forth. That's why we should call them state schools. These are government-run schools. Yes. These are not public schools. Right. They're run by the government who is ruled by an authoritarian left-wing party. That's right. And so that's why when you walk into a public school today, it's a discipleship. It's not even a, it's not even a, a academic brain, brainwashing. It's an emotional brainwashing. So it's, it's truly a discipleship. And that's why these kids, they behave like missionaries because they're trained like one. And that's, so whatever their, whatever their social contagion, they want the child to regurgitate, that's their mission. And so anything, whether it be climate changeism, 
uh, whether it be uh, gun control, abortion, anything, whether you have one opinion on this or not, they're teaching children in schools only one way. And that's how they're, that's, that's that critical consciousness that underpins a lot of the critical race theory. And transgenderism is just one of the ways. It's not a separate thing. It's just one branch. And it's an effective branch because it sexualizes kids and obviously it, 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 it destroys them and that creates very useful, angry soldiers. So we wondered, do DEI or CRT make John Amanchuwu feel included as a black man in America? What does it mean to you as a black man, as a black father? Do you feel protected or included by knowing that there's a DEI officer at every school? No, I don't. It doesn't benefit blacks through DEI. In North Carolina, in, in particular, when you consider Wake County, we've had a DEI office since 2013, and they have spent nearly $8.7 million on that office. And where are the measurable outcomes? You can't find any. But what about the good teachers? There has to be some good teachers left, right? Right. But to find the schools and teachers who aren't embracing this woke revolution, you have to be involved and not be afraid to ruffle a few feathers by asking questions. You're a teacher who refused the transgender ideology at your school, and in return you were fired, and the school refused to accommodate your religious beliefs. How did that make you feel? It felt surreal, and it still does, honestly. Um, you could have never told me that I would spend seven years going to college to become a teacher, you know, live out my dream, impacting and influencing, you know, the next generations only to six years into my career be let go of because according to my school district, they could not accommodate my religious beliefs. So that's where it gets really interesting because it started with, as you mentioned, the transgender policies that were placed on me. These policies they presented me really essentially are wrapped around lying. So lying to students first and foremost because they, they've asked me to call children by whatever they want to be called by, whatever gender pronoun it is, I have to go along with that. And so if you really think about that, right, that is lying to a child because they're confused. And as adults, we're supposed to, to step in and guide them you know, on the, the path of success and prosperity and, and hope and positivity. And, and to go along with the, the lies that they're experiencing, um, that, that would not be, in my eyes, doing my job. And so it was so bizarre for the district to say, no, 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 you have to. To, get it, to keep your job, you have to go along with it. So to be very clear, the policy was, if you have a student and they say that they go by Zim mm -hmm. or clown clown self, which is a real pronoun yep. that some people use, mm -hmm. you had to call them that. Correct. And it gets worse than that too. When they presented that um, policy to me that I had to, they said, refer and respect students' gender preference or pronouns, they, that was in writing. And they then said vocally, you also need to withhold that from parents. And I looked the superintendent, assistant superintendent, like dead in the eye, and I said, are you asking me to lie to parents? And he said, yes. The problem with cultural revolutions is that they build underground, almost invisibly, for many years until they happen seemingly all at once, in such a dizzying pace that it'll make your head spin. And while they're all different, Every destructive cultural revolution has a few things in common. One is separating parents from their children. This even happened to my family in Cuba where they survived a communist revolution. Kids in state schools were reported for reporting on their family members. Not dissimilar from how some were asked to report on their families during COVID if they broke COVID guidelines. And if you think you're automatically safe in private schools, think again. So if a parent says, I want to get away from this craziness in the public schools, they send their kid to private school, their kid is safe now, correct? Unfortunately, no. It's, wouldn't, it, I think it used to be that simple, but today, unfortunately, it's not. And so most private schools are under the umbrella of the NAIS, which is, stands for the National Association of Independent Schools. Just because you send a child to private school, it doesn't mean that they're automatically safe at all. 
Uh, so for, there's really two reasons for that. Number one, the NAIS, they have these decrees that they come down and say, you have to follow these. Now, does every private school follow it to the T? No, but a lot of private schools do. NAIS is an organization thousands of private schools in America associate with. And it's at the forefront of pushing this far left ideology. They even make recommendations that they stop using terms like boys and girls in favor of gender neutral terms like students. And at their annual People of Color conference, they had panels called White Boys Behaving Badly and another panel called No More White Tears. Suffice to say that if your child is in a private school, ask that school about their association with NAIS. Besides the NAIS, they're still largely using the same pool of teachers. So just because a teacher goes to a private school, they're still being trained under the same colleges that indoctrinate the teachers. Parents are trying to find a path of least resistance. What's the least I can do to, send my, to get my children to education? This movement of separating children, of creating the revolutionists, is everywhere. It's in cereal boxes, is on YouTube shorts and YouTube kids and Instagram stories and private schools and public schools and in Barnes and Nobles and everywhere. And so you can't as a parent ever say, my child is good, because you're always, you need to have your hands in everything that they do. The key to regime change and revolutions is to separate children from their parents. Bad actors are working to do this now through various means. One of those is gender ideology. Your daughter was secretly transitioned at school. My father um, passed away uh, and unexpectedly, and then I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So my daughter was in fifth grade at the time and um, was distraught over some of our family dynamics. Reached out to a guidance counselor and told her that she uh, thought she was a boy. That guidance counselor um, immediately walked her after that meeting back to class and asked her if she wanted to be called her boy name and boy pronouns at school and went ahead with that transition without me knowing. There's a policy in place right now that if your child identifies as a transgender and they just have to say that you know they're not ready to tell their family that the school can transition them without your knowledge this policy has to do with children as young as five all the way through high school a five-year-old can be transitioned at school without parents ever being notified in the state of california yep all the all the child has to say is that they aren't ready for their family to know and it's all in the name of the child's right to privacy. Well, if they're able to consent to something as serious as changing their sex without their parents knowing, wouldn't the next natural step be people saying, oh, they can consent to sex with adults then? To me, that sounds crazy, but also what's going on when it originally it happened, I felt was crazy. And that's why I worked my way up within the district saying, how could you allow this with my child? When summer hit and she was removed from that environment and she wasn't around that counselor and that school, she immediately went back to wanting to be a girl. As she came to me after a couple months and said, mom, what happened to me at school was just so wrong. I just feel like it was really fast and I really didn't understand what being trans really meant. This agenda has been more successful than some realize. The CDC's most recent report on youth found that a record 25% of high school students identify as something other than straight. That's an over 600% increase from the 2.8% of baby boomers who identify as LGBTQ. Pro-mutilation activists have said this is because of increased acceptance, but we found that this is a number not replicated anywhere else in the world. Something else is happening and that something else is a social contagion. A social contagion is the spread of emotions or behaviors from one individual to another, sometimes without awareness. Social contagion processes become problematic when they lead to spades of self-injurious behaviors. That sounds an awful lot like what's happening when TikTok feeds you videos about transgender ideology and you start to question your own gender. The attack on identity becomes even clearer when you see a mom describe how they knew their kid was trans based on their green vegetable eating habits. The pattern of everything um, that he had experienced as a child, including eating green vegetables because that boosts testosterone, were just methods of his body trying to become who he was meant to be. You see, successful countries, a lot like successful people, have a track record of certain traits, like strength, 
resilience, outside the box thinking, and confidence. One key ingredient of confidence is identity, knowing who you are. If you want to shake the confidence of a person or a country, you must create an identity crisis. It might seem to many like this ideology with pronouns as crazy as clown and clown self sprang up overnight, but in reality the groundwork was laid many years before by John Money and Alfred Kinsey. Money tried his theories first on twin boys, who he experimented on. One brother was mutilated and raised as a girl, but he never felt like one. Despite pretending this was a success, both brothers ended up committing suicide. At this point, I doubt it'll shock you to find out that Hugh Hefner and Playboy were key parts of Kinsey's plan to sexualize our country. If Kinsey is the bridge and his science is the bridge to the law, to change the laws, well then Hugh Hefner was the bridge from Kinsey to culture. Uh, Alfred Kinsey actually met Hugh Hefner when he was in college. Um, and Hugh Hefner was a virgin at the time. And he revolutionizes Hugh Hefner uh, into the playboy that uh, he would become. Hugh Hefner would say things like fornicate early, fornicate often, and fornicate everywhere. So, what's the motto of Playboy? Bunny. Yeah. And what do bunnies do? They hump. And what is, what is Hugh Hefner's bunny wearing? A bow tie. Every photo of Alfred Kinsey, he is wearing a tweed suit and a bow tie. And, and by the way, Kinsey built his public appearance um, with this lie that he was a happily married man, a heterosexual, um, and faithful to his wife. His biographer would later admit that uh, Kinsey was a sadomasochist, homosexual, sexual deviant pedophile. When we begin to understand the, the history behind this agenda, which wasn't just to um, disciple children through the public school system, it was to actually change laws all around America that were passed with the explicit intention of protecting children, family, and marriages. The goal was to actually work through the American Law Institute and other revolutionary groups to bring in this new social science. How then are we going to get this kind of curriculum into the schools? Well, we have to pass laws. But they had to get this new social science um, into curriculum. But then we gotta get, we gotta get the state boards of education to accept it, right? So you know what they did? They start sending sex experts to lobby and argue before state boards of education to accept this new radical sex ed as just the norm, healthy, public health kind of curriculum we need. Penthouse footed the bill to send the sex experts to lobby before state boards of education to allow for this kind of comprehensive sexuality. Education, yes, Penthouse and Playboy, of course. Some of Secus's early pamphlets in 1964 and 1965 never used the term person or child or human. They always used the term sexual being to refer to human beings because that's how they see us. One of the early board members of Secus was named Wardell Pomeroy. Wardell Pomeroy was a very close friend of Kinsey. Some people actually think a lover. <laughs> um, guess who became the executive director of the Kinsey Institute? Wardell Pomeroy. In 1980, in, a, in an article called Attacking the Last Taboo, Wardell Pomeroy was described as part of the pro-incest lobby. And in this interview with Time Magazine, he says, incest between children and adults can sometimes be beneficial and it need not be a sign of mental illness. That was said by the executive director of the Kinsey Institute and one of the first board members. The, the primary problem with Kinsey was that his entire social science and science on sex was based off of lies. So his, his uh, book, published in 1948, was called uh, Sexuality and the Human Male. Um, then in 1958, he publishes Sexuality and the Human Female, which is the same year the Playboy is launched by Hugh Hefner. And he claims that, that most American men, about 90% of American men are not faithful to their wives. Uh, most of them have homosexual tendencies and engage in homosexual sex. Y you read his numbers and his predictions in his books and you're like, how, how, where does this come from? Well, what he had done is he had gone into the prisons and he had interviewed rapists and pedophiles serving life sentences, guys. <laughs> and so he went into the prisons and he actually interviewed pedophiles. And so he asked them about their sexual experiences with children, guys, is what he does. And so at Table 34, this is the kind of the infamous 
um, table in his book, Sexuality and the Human Male. It documents um, the rape of children uh, as young as about 18 months old uh, and as old as about 10 or 11. With how many orgasms the children had over a 24 hour period timed with a stopwatch. And Kinsey believed that even if these children were, were riling, writhing, screaming and moaning in pain, that that was just proof that they were taking pleasure from this sexual act being done on them. Is there a, an agenda to normalize pedophilic behavior? And so when, when you look at Kinsey, when you look at his obsession with incest and with the sexuality of children, it's, it's hard to not believe that the agenda was not to normalize eventually any form of sexual behavior. Queer theory is also why you might see activists using terms woman with a Y or woman with an X. Those aren't typos, those are to remove the word men from women. Another sliver of reality they seek to destroy. Couple the vile beliefs of John Money, Alfred Kinsey, and queer theory with TikTok and our social contagion of identity confusion among youth is what you get. In some pockets of the country, this social contagion is even clearer, like California's Davis Joint Unified School District, where students self-identify as transgender 4.3 times the national average. Would you guys say that people who are identifying as all these things are being treated better? Well, they're getting affirmed by culture, and culture is the big elephant in the room because it's like, everything is affected by culture. And so if culture affirms it, that means you're universally accepted. What happens is they come from these environments that they don't feel valued, they don't feel loved. So what happens is they get this admiration from people around them and these people around them encourage them to continue doing what they do and then they get too deep and they value the affection and the attention that they get because they so, so want it, but they have never gotten it before. Absolutely, that's why they gave uh, Mr. Thomas, William Thomas, uh, the trophy rather than Riley Gaines. Yeah, that's the, like one of the best examples you could use. Exactly. Well, at this private school, people, the teachers, would favor these kids who were going through this, and they would give them extra attention. Them, like after time, after class, more attention towards them, they're just like worshiping these kids, and that makes them feel good and that makes them want to continue to do it and make it worse, put it out there more, and indoctrinate other people, their friends, their family, into this ideology. California's 2020 to 2021 main report of the California Healthy Kids Survey also found that kids who identify as non-binary self-report far more mental illness than other kids do, including chronic depression and suicidal ideation. If you think kids can't be influenced by a litany of algorithms on TikTok, and you're not familiar with the famous psychological experiment conducted by a man named Robert Kleck. He was a psychologist at Dartmouth University. In the experiment, they put a fake scar on people's faces who were going into a room with other people. But right before they went into mingle with the crowd, the makeup artist made what the subject thought was a touch-up to make the scar more visible. But in reality, they removed it before they entered the room. At the end, they were asked if they were discriminated against over their scar. Nearly all of them reported that they were discriminated against. They were confident that their scar was being stared at or that people made rude comments. They felt that way after only one impression seeing the scar on their face via a small pocket mirror. Now imagine how sure a teen feels about their identity confusion if they're fed a steady stream of videos on the TikTok algorithm about transitioning. At least the social contagions when we were kids didn't hurt you long term. Maybe you had a weird haircut, a piercing, or a very unique style, but you outgrew it. You can't outgrow a double mastectomy though. If you watch the news, you've probably heard politicians and pundits saying things like this. Transgender children are not having surgeries. That's really important to say. In his tweet, he talked about stopping surgeries for people under 18, which is not a thing. That is not a thing that happens. There is misinformation presented that somehow that we're doing surgery on minors or even children, and that simply is not true. So Layla Jane, how old were you when they gave you a double mastectomy? It was a month after my 13th birthday. How long was the process before that with the doctors to, to prepare you for this. I initially started seeing doctors for my gender dysphoria um, when I was 12. So it was within that time frame, um, within a year. What age were you when they put you on puberty blockers? I was 12 years old. 12 years old, 
doctors gave you a drug called Lupron. This drug has been used to chemically castrate sex offenders, pedophiles in prison, but they prescribed it to you to stop your hormones. Is that correct? Correct. At 12 years old. Do you believe that you were given informed consent about the risks of puberty blockers? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, it was spoken of very lightly. You know, I mean, they really did say it. It's just a pause. Um, there were some slight concerns about my, mo my bone development, but, you know, they just told me to take some vitamin D. Um, that's it. That's, that's the only thing they were concerned about while giving you a chemical castration drug that they give to pedophiles that isn't actually designed or made to stop your puberty. It's not even approved for that. They're just playing, you know, doctor. They're doing science experiments on, on little kids. You know, at that age, you were still, you were still very much a kid. Right? Right. I mean, I was really naive. I didn't have an understanding of the world. I wasn't even in high school yet. It'll never leave my mind how Layla looked when she walked in the room with us. She was a damaged young girl. Her anxiety was palpable. Before she ever said a word, my heart sank as I wondered how a doctor could ever operate on such a vulnerable child. They took an oath to do no harm. How? And then it hit me. We have a daughter older than Layla was when the doctors did this to her. The other side says to listen to trans people. Well, Layla did identify as trans. And when you were experiencing the gender dysphoric feelings, was there any inquiry as to what that root cause might be? Or was there just, you know, seemingly this shift laser focused on the gender transition? Definitely, there was definitely a shift. And they really kind of ignored my comorbid mental health issues like anxiety and whatnot. Um, I remember one of my doctors said that if I transition, my anxiety and my mental health would get better. Did the doctors warn you at all about potential side effects from a double mastectomy, like seriously warn you about the long-term consequences of a dangerous surgery like that? Really, the main thing was they told me, and this is what they, the words they used, they told me I wouldn't be able to chest feed. Um, I might have some slight cosmetic, um, they called it dog ears. Um, is like the term. I think it's like when the scars sag. Um, but that's really all they warned me about. Like when I was in the healing phase, the first year or so, the nerves kept reconnecting over my scar tissue and it was just excruciating. And were any of those regressive uh, gender stereotypes used as a, you know, factor of, oh, well, you might like this color or this clothing, so therefore yeah. you should, you know, transition. I was a bit tomboyish as a kid. Like, I used to love Hot Wheels and I used to follow my dad around the garage and stuff like that. I wasn't big on dolls and I definitely was like, you know what, makes sense. I kind of latched onto that as more proof that I was trans. Can you speak a little bit to your experience and how that pressure affected your body image, your self-perception, and your idea of what it means to be a woman. Yeah, I mean, around the time um, I fell into all this, like, now it's like in to be like curvy and whatnot, but back then it was the thigh gap, um, and I didn't have that build, and it, yeah. Were there some, you know, uh, like body issues as far as like eating disorders or anything that played a role that maybe then turned into that more gender dysphoric symptomology? Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely had some issues with, um, you know, my relationship with food and my body and whatnot that just went completely unresolved. And they got really bad after I had top surgery and I need something else, I guess, for my brain to focus all the negative energy on myself. Is there a difference? between somebody who's anorexic or bulimic going to a doctor and requesting liposuction, and a child going to a doctor and requesting to have their healthy body parts chopped off. You know, lately I'm having a harder time seeing the difference, especially if they would've gave me liposuction, I would've, I would've done it. That's very important you said that. Admitting that you would've gotten liposuction if they would've allowed it, that tells us that you couldn't have possibly consented to anything else. Do you feel like you had informed consent? No, I mean, even the way they watered down their wording and called it top surgery instead of a double mastectomy. 
you know, and there's just a lot of information that I didn't know about, like my own anatomy. Because mind you, I was so young, I hadn't taken a sex ed class. I hadn't even seen like diagrams. I think the biggest thing that they left out that I still deal with sometimes is the nerve damage on my scars and my chest. You know, they told me I might lose sensation, but I was expecting numbness. I wasn't expecting like the electrifying jolts and just itchy sensation that I can't scratch. What were some of the effects of testosterone in your female body? Increased permanent body hair. My voice has deepened. I don't know if you can see it under the lighting, but I actually, I have a slight Adam's apple. Uh, Is it your hope that those things will go away? I, well, I've just kind of accepted that some of these things I have to live with. You know, this Adam's apple is always gonna be here unless I get it shaved down surgically. Um, you know, I have increased bodily hair and a little bit of facial hair that continues to grow. Um, I was under the impression that would stop if I stopped taking testosterone, um, and it didn't. There's another, that's another thing they didn't inform you about. Correct. Who paid for all of these medical interventions? Was it insurance, were there it, private groups? or It was covered by Kaiser. Everything? Yeah. Now, does Kaiser cover your aftercare now that you've detransitioned? No, um, not really. Layla's case is heartbreaking, not only because of what she was put through, but because she's not an anomaly. She's a drop of rain in a storm that's coming. A Reddit group called Dtrans has grown to nearly 50,000 members this year. Some critics say, I thought you believed in parental rights but parental rights don't allow you to abuse your child by giving them a sex change any more than it allows you to legally turn them into a heroin addict. In the US, one study found that 70% of pediatric patients are diagnosed with autism, ADHD, or some other mental health problem prior to being diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Kids are not the only people being abused in this scheme. Parents in the oath to do no harm are being abused as well. When I heard a pediatric doctor from Stanford using the phrase, daughter with a penis during a TED talk, I knew we had entered dangerous new territory. Right when Avery was handed to her mom, her mom sensed a special bond, a mother's intuition that Avery was different. And her parents, as soon as Avery was a preschooler, knew that as a daughter with a penis, they needed to advocate for her rights. The trust bond where kids believe doctors and do as they say is a no-brainer when you consider the Milgram experiments from the 1960s. In the 60s, a social psychologist named Stanley Milgram conducted several studies at Yale on obedience and authority. Milgram wanted to know why people do evil things. In his book, Obedience to Authority, Stanley mused that most evil acts are committed by normal people who blindly obey authority. Basically, he believed that most people would stray from basic morality if someone in authority told them to. And he was right. In the experiments, Stanley had an authority figure tell unknowing participants to deliver electric shocks of increasing intensity to what they believed to be a real patient, and deliver the shocks all the way up to max intensity even when the fake patient begged them to stop, asked for mercy, and even when they told them that they had a heart condition. So when a doctor tells a confused child that they are, in fact, born in the wrong body by immediately affirming gender dysphoria, they are, in effect, the supervisor telling the child to turn the electric shocks all the way up. What are some of the more egregious programs that our taxpayer dollars are funding that harm children? I think it's mainly through the schools. You know, my concern is really about, about kids who aren't ready to make this decision. You know, people say, oh, you're a libertarian. What are you, what are you getting involved with this, the bedroom and all that? And I was like, you know, I don't care what adults do in the bedroom, but I do care you know, if they have to tell my ch children about it, why are they involved with, this has to be something they need to tell the children in elementary school. They've got to tell them at the library. They've got to tell them in all these public venues. You know, 10 years ago, do you think anybody, I don't remember any conservatives complaining about a drag show for adults. You know, they're adult places that you can go around town, bars have ages. We've always had sort of this idea of adults can make decisions, and we may not approve of other people's decisions, but for the most part, we're like, live and let live, leave people alone. But with kids, there is an obligation. I mean, for example, if a child is being abused at home, even by the parents, physically or otherwise, the state has an obligation to go in and rescue that child. I think it's the same here, but it's the opposite. The government's funding the schools, and then the schools are saying, oh, we're not going to tell the parents. 
And we're going to change the kids' clothes, call them by another name, encourage counselors. I mean, ultimately, we're going to talk about are they going to give the counselors going to give them medication there at school without their parents' permission? I mean, I think we're leading towards an absurd and horrific time, and there already are these cases, you know, parents taking their kids to California. You know, your 13-year-old's going to have irreversible surgery and the father doesn't want it, and they're calling the father somehow a hater and the father has no rights over the child now. I mean, this is leading to a, a time in which there's going to be war between families, war in our culture. You know, this is, is, a, is, a, is a bad time, and I never thought we'd get there in our lifetime, that this is where we've, where we've come. Can you tell us the answer since Dr. Rachel Levine wouldn't? Can a child consent to these transgender surgeries? You know, it's a question that's been going on for a long time. What's the age of adulthood? When can children make decisions about their medical care? We always had, and it was pretty much decided. I mean, I've worked as an emergency room doctor. If kids came in, with, even with a small laceration, we would begin cleaning it up, but we wouldn't sew it up, even a small little incision, till the mom or dad got there. In Oregon, your kid can transition at 13 and have parts of their body removed, but can't get a tattoo without their parents' permission. It's kind of sort of absurd. And it's sort of the opposite of what you hear from the media. From the media, you hear all these kids are being bullied, and they're going to commit suicide because they're being bullied. I think it's the opposite. I think they're being encouraged, they're being affirmed, everybody's saying we're so proud of you. If you go or someone advises you go to a gender dysphoria clinic, I guess they don't even call it dysphoria, gender affirming clinic, whatever they want to call it. When you get there, there's nobody giving you the other side of the story. The only people who work in these clinics are people who have either had the surgery themselves or are huge advocates for this. It's a one-sided process. What can you do? Speak up. That's what every abuse survivor we've talked to has asked you to do. The conversations are going to be uncomfortable. You may lose a friend or a client, but speaking up is how this ends. Some may even ask you, why do you care? These aren't your kids. Let them do what they want. But this line of thinking ignores the reality that our kids are going to have to grow up alongside these issues and sometimes inside a locker room with them. We were forced to swim against biological male Leah Thomas, who is formerly Will Thomas, who swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania. Of course, then transitioning to the women's category his senior year to where he dominated the women. First of all, we weren't forewarned we would be sharing a locker. We had no idea. We're in this locker room, I'm changing. I had my back turned, silent. I turn around, a six foot four, 22 year old man disrobing, fully intact with an exposing male genitalia. The only time we became aware that this was the arrangement was when we had to see it with our own eyes. So any man would have had full access to that bathroom, any coach, any parent, any, any pervert who wanted to would have had full reins to be in there and bare minimum, we weren't even told about this. So they most certainly want to normalize this. They want to take away our rights to privacy. Is it fair to refer to what happened to you with Leah Thomas exposing his penis to you and other female swimmers, mental rape? No, it most certainly is fair to say that. In fact, if a man would have walked into a woman's locker room, a DA is walking in there arresting this man and he is getting charged with sexual harassment, voyeurism, indecent exposure, and I'm, I'm sure the list can go on of, of, of charges. But now it really is celebrated. It's encouraged. That next day of competition was the day that Thomas and I raced. And almost impossibly enough, it resulted in a tie. We get out, we go behind the awards podium where the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself and says, great job, but you guys tied and we only have one trophy. We're gonna give Leah the trophy because Leah has to have it for pictures. That's when I was no longer willing to lie. Um, and that's when I ultimately took this public stance and acknowledging how it's harmful to women, not just female athletes, to women. Leah Thomas was nominated for NCAA Woman of the Year. That's how they honored Thomas for taking away our rights to our privacy, for taking away our scholarships, our spots on that podium, our dignity. This award was devalued to me. It was meaningless. I didn't want this award. They're encouraging men to go into women's locker rooms and for others to be complicit in the process. Average people like us, we look at what happened and we go, Riley, Riley won. You know, no normal person is going Leah won. I think what's really worse is the situation happening in the locker room because this is this is sexual assault and instead of treating it like sexual assault, we've got a group of people in our country who are running a large majority of our country who are actually more likely to charge someone like you with a hate crime for saying something about it than they are to go after the man who's exposing themselves. To. When they can't win this argument or get confronted with victims of their ideology, they often turn to something Marxist revolutionaries have always turned to. 
old-fashioned lying. That's why they try to claim these surgeries don't exist, despite mountains of evidence that they're happening at record rates. And it's why you'll hear people pretending that there's no competitive advantage for men or boys playing sports against actual women. Women you and some that are short. You don't believe that a biological male has a physical advantage in sports over a biological female? Not as def a definitive statement. 